This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Detroit is the greatest! Straight up light you on fire for a Coney dog right now. And I wish I would have heard more of that on Sunday, but you are listening to the Motor City Sports Rant on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. We're back after a week off with some technical difficulties, some people staying inside when they thought that there was going to be too much snow out. I'm Jason Jarvie. Follow me on Twitter at Jarvie the King. And with me as always, he actually got up out of bed and he came to his office to do some work. John the Doc Macaroon. What's up, sir? Yes, sir, Jason. Hey, I missed you. I missed uh, rapping sports. We got a chance today to talk about the Lions, the panic that has set in across Metro Detroit. Got to check in a little bit with the Wings and Pistons, maybe a little bit of Michigan State basketball. But when we do this podcast, obviously it's our chance to vent a little bit, our chance to catch up with what's been going on in the week in sports. So yeah, the snowmageddon does affect us and what we do, and, and I don't want to put anybody in jeopardy to come from where they're coming from to Sterling Heights. So we're working on things and trying to figure out ways to you know do the podcast where I don't have to come into the office, but I like it. I like the sounds of the office. I like doing it here. But before we talk about the lines, I just want to get a sense of what do you do for your Christmas shopping, because for me, I did it all on Sunday. After the Lions loss, I knew that the plan was to get out to the malls and to take care of all the Christmas shopping for all the kids. And then I realized, oh my goodness, on Christmas Eve and on Christmas, we're going to family members' house. So that means it adds like five to six more people that you got to buy for. And I'm like, my goodness, you know, working all year, you set aside a little bit of a budget for Christmas and you try to take care of everybody. But this year I added like five, six people that I'm buying for because I'm going to their house. And I'm like, wait, I'm like, wait, honey, we're going to someone's house. She's like, yes, I told you. Didn't you listen? Like, no, not really. But uh, it does. You know, I don't want to be like a Grinch, but I'm like, ooh. Maybe, you know, staying at home might save me a couple hundred bucks because you got to add potentially to buy for five, six other people. So I got it all done. The wallet is a little bit light, but within reason, I was within budget. So it was cool. But uh, what do you guys do? Do you do? Because the, the missus asked me, hey, what do I get? What do I get you for Christmas and things like that? And I was like, I don't, I don't really know. I have no clue yet this year what I want, but uh you know, and for everyone out there that's listening, hopefully not my wife. I haven't gotten her anything just yet, so I got to take care of it. Shame, I'm, shame. I'm a last minute no. guy always. I'm it's, last it's minute. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. And before I was married, uh, you know, we were still going out, and I probably I put off a lot of things. I usually, if I if I was lucky, it would be like the week or two before Christmas that I'd get my shopping done. But more than likely, it would be the week of Christmas or on Christmas Eve. I would literally be that guy who would go out to the mall and be rushing around trying to find something. And even, I think, as early as, as late as two years ago, uh, I that was me. I was still finishing up. And really, since we've, since I've gotten married, uh, people are going to, I mean, the guys aren't going to roast me, but and my wife is actually taking care of a lot of the shopping because a lot of the things that we are buying is for kids because uh, we don't do a ton of gift-giving between um, myself and my brother and my mom and dad, uh, because really there isn't really a nest, a need for anything. Anything we need is like, I don't know, a trip to, to Florida or something like that. A lot of it, I mean, you know, my wife does a lot of that stuff and I love her and I thank her every single day for that. Um, and you know, this year I think we did a little bit on like the, not technically the black Friday. We did it. I think maybe during the afternoon of black Friday, we, we weren't those guys, sitting outside at uh, midnight, even though Black Friday isn't actually Black Friday anymore. It starts on the Wednesday. So uh, I know we have a little bit more, and yeah, I will actually say I haven't bought anything for my wife, but it is planned. She hasn't bought anything for me either. Uh, Money is tight around the house. We do have a child coming on the way, so uh, we have uh, a lot of things to to spend 
it, it's really come down to we actually know what we would get each other, and it, it it'll just come down to hey, you know, if it comes that we have the money, then we'll we'll get what we get. Um, have you guys done a baby shower yet? Has that taken place? We've had my family or my family uh, through just a, a a family baby shower with just the the close family there. But uh, beginning of the year, my in laws they are throwing kind of the everybody other everybody else baby shower. Our friends, their friends, the entire her family is gigantic. My uh, my my wife's father is the youngest of seven, so there's tons. I mean, we have cousins who are in their you know late forties. So it's a it's a fun time. It's a it's Christmas. I always uh. You feeling the, ready to be a pops? I am ready to be a pop. It's, I mean, I'm as ready as I'm going to be. I mean, I don't think I, anybody could ever actually really be truly ready and be prepared. Everyone always tells me to to catch up on sleep and you know enjoy it enjoy it while you while you got it. And you know, I I'm like I don't sleep that much anyways. I think it's it's completely overrated. I think it's really going to be something that I just experienced because I think it'll probably. And I got a, a small taste of it when my sister in law had her baby. She had her baby this past uh, Feb or this past January, and I went over there. And I hung and I hung out with her for a little while because I wasn't working as much. I was working at night, so I would go keep her company. Because you know, if a wife has to stay at home with a crying child all day long, it's she's gonna go crazy. So I, I went over there and I hung out, and I find at that point I f- had finally got that instinct that you know what i kind of understand why parents can go crazy from a a kid crying just constantly there's nothing you can do to 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 make them feel better they're just gonna cry and i'm like why you know i'll I'll, i hold it for for a little while i'm like oh you know it's okay it's okay and then you know 20 minutes later you're like why are you still crying and it's it's nothing you can do and that's it's just it's gonna be an experience man well, the good thing is, you know, you said, like you said, your brother, you know, has kids, you have experience, you get a chance to talk to people. Hey, if you ever need any questions, just uh, if you have anything you need at all, just shoot me a message. And hey, from the podcast, um, when you have the baby, you probably can get a couple weeks off, maybe two, three oh, weeks. Oh, thank you. Paternity Jim. leave. We won't, uh, you know, just make it all about the missus and get her six weeks. You can get half of that. Maybe if you want to take two, maybe three podcasts off, I'll consider it. But make sure you get your written request in because the due date's what, February? End of February. Yep, okay. I'll, I'll make sure to have those papers signed, dot That's the right. I's, cross the T's. That's right. Another, I mean, it's a this is a random tangent, but paternity and maternity leave. America is a joke. <laughs> yeah, it's not it, good. Right? It gets garbage. Like I, I mean, my some places are have it okay. Like I know, and I mean, for maternity leave, most people get like the four months. But I mean, you you hear about four these, months, six weeks average after the birth of the baby. That's yeah, the average. Six weeks places. is by law. But uh, like, there's there's countries yeah. where like parent like mothers get an entire year off, and they get to to spend that with their child. I mean, that if if the, we if we had that in America, that would be I think that'd be a game changer. We might actually be able to become a better society. Well, it's well, just listen, ridiculous. listen, we're not that mean here. So you and Matthew Stafford are going to be new dads in 2017. So you have that in common, and uh, you guys will be. Just fine. Don't worry about it. Hey, you can take as much time as you need. We'll just dock you when you come back. That's all. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about. I did. Uh, we went to Frankenmuth over the, over the weekend. Have you been there? I've been there. You Not- know they're famous for their chicken dinners. I'm tired of their chicken. Really? I've we we go at least once a year, maybe twice or even three times. We'll we'll, we'll we spread it out. And I I like the butter noodles. Love all the sides, but the chicken, man. I'm just tired of the chicken. And when we went yesterday, I didn't get chicken. No chicken. No, I did not get the chicken. I was like, I can't do it. I can't do the chicken anymore. And I got one of their other German specials, and I was completely satisfied. What'd you get? I got it was like a a Bavarian combination. It was like a uh, a pork schnitzel, a smoked ham, and then uh, another beef with like a red wine sauce. And then it came with like these little potato cheese puffs. Man, I'm I'm not sure if I'm gonna ever have Franklin with chicken again. Oh well, I, listen. At this point in time, when you go at, at, at the frequency level that you go, I could see why you might get sick of it. And try something else. 
But uh, do you also walk the street in Frankenmuth? Check out all the cheese places and check out all the other shops in Frankenmuth besides the Christmas store, besides the, the, the places where you can get good food and stuff like that. Do you check out the shops in and around Frankenmuth? When I was a kid, we used to – I mean, it was before they had that whole other section because now they have, they have the two. They have the street, and then they have, like, the little kind of outdoor mall type thing. We don't really do the street anymore. We'll, we will if it's if it was nice and it wasn't like below freezing. We, we'd walk around there because there's some interesting stores just to go in and see. There's a one. There's the Grand Traverse Distillery where you can. Uh, I like to just look because some of it is more expensive and you can actually like get something where you can uh, you can age your own whiskey. And I think that'd be pretty cool. But yeah, after after the Frankenmuth dinner, we did go to Bronner's because, as I said, with my sister in law and her. Her child, it was going to be her first visit to Santa Claus. And so I, I assumed we get to Bronner's, and I'm like, it's going to be pretty busy. It's like the weekend before for before Christmas. It's going to be pretty busy. The line, it'll probably be maybe about an hour at most. But we get there, and we get, like, this special sticker that when they call it over the big speaker, you know, your kid gets to go. And then we saw the, the list of all the stickers that they call. And it's probably a list of about 30 different stickers. And they're all the way up the top. And our stickers all the way at the bottom. So it's like around 2.30 there. And it's bananas in the place. We didn't see Santa until 5. Oh. Luckily, though, they were smart. I, I give Bronner's a lot of credit. They set up a TV in one of the entrances. And people, you know, dudes could just watch the Lions game. So I got to watch that Lions debacle. At Bronner's, at the the largest Christmas store in the world. Yeah. This 89th edition, we're going to talk about the lines here rather quickly. And maybe in the second half, we'll peek in a little bit on what the hell's been going on with Michigan State Athletics. Arguably, 2016 is a year that many of us are going to want to forget. And maybe at the tail end, we'll peek in the, the wings and the pistons. But yeah, there's a lot of news with our Michigan State Spartans that we got to talk about. But uh, yeah, the uh, the Giants game, man, it was tough. A lot of people went into the game, myself included, thinking that the Lions, if they performed, could walk away with the victory because the Giants offense sometimes goes cold and they're, they go three and out. They're really, you know, doesn't they don't have a super strong running game. It's basically Eli Manning and Odell Beckham Jr. They have Jr. a worse running game than us. Exactly. And so you went in there and you thought that, and, and most people felt like the Lions were going to go all out and give their best performance. And I guess to start, the first thing that surprised me was the Lions, whether you give the Giants defense a lot of credit or not, I just didn't feel like the Lions brought their A game to this, knowing that there was so much at stake. It was disappointing because from Jim Caldwell to the offense, to the defense, I kind of just felt like they brought a B-plus game, and a B-plus game on the road versus the Giants, who were 9-4, and four, just wasn't good enough. So it was disappointing. The first half going into the third quarter was just, again, brutal to watch. And a lot of people tweeted me, they didn't even start watching the game until 3 p.m., knowing that most of the time these games aren't being decided until the fourth quarter. And I just go, man, what a tough watch the first three quarters of that one. I mean, it's it's like I'm, you could say B+. Plus. I'm not even sure I think B- minus at best because I think the defense... They gave you exactly what the defense has been doing. They didn't give up a, I mean, they gave up yards, but they were holding them. You know, they only scored 17 points and, you know, Odell Beckham had to pull out one of the, probably one of the best catches of the year to score one of those touchdowns. So you can't really blame this on the defense. It's just a lack. It's, it is somewhat worrisome that the offense just can't get it going that they it's like they have to be in the two minute offense to get anything done and it it begins with a the Jim Caldwell's need to tr- try to run the ball and we don't have a running back we have zero running backs i mean we have running backs on our rosters but Zach Zenner Dwayne Washington Joyke Bell they aren't NFL caliber running backs and i think it's it's you can argue Theo Riddick Probably not a, he's a pass catching running back. He's not the guy you're going to put in there for three downs of, for, a, he's not a three down back. And Amir Abdullah, the, the book is just completely out of the, on him. So why does he continue to run the ball? You're essentially giving the Giants, you're saying, hey, you get a free play. You don't have to really do anything here except stop us, which 
you're more than likely going to do. See, that, that I agree with you 100%. You have an opportunity to get a solid running back, but you got, you chose, I think, the wrong one. Amir Abdullah is injury-prone, and now you got to go. Basically, this year is a wash for him. You could have had you know, a different running back, you know, Johnson from Arizona. But Or this year you could have maybe traded up and done some things and maybe gotten a much better running back. But this is what they're going with. And, again, this is why a lot of people are questioning the Lions and are panicking right now because you don't really have, in terms of the offense, a number one receiver. You don't really have a number one running back. You're basically going out there and you're riding the coattails of Matthew Stafford, and he's a little bit nicked up. He was okay, but the offense didn't score an offensive touchdown. And that leads you to go, "Uh uh-oh, it leads a lot of people to panic a little bit in that going forward, if this offense doesn't get a little bit more creative against tougher teams, it's super tough. And I've said it week in, week out. This offense is not creative at all. And versus a good team like the Giants, I don't see an avenue for them to play better. I mean, you tried to throw the ball deep a couple times to Marvin Jones, and it was effective, but the frequency in which the Lions are getting chunk plays versus good teams isn't that good. And many people are questioning now, okay, you played the Titans, you've played the Packers, you've played now um, the New York Giants, above average teams, and each time you've played an above average team, you've kind of walked away with a, with, with a loss. So there's a lot of factors that uh, we're going to go into, but the first one that I think a lot of people are looking at is this offense is too conservative, and that is a reflection of Jim Caldwell and Jim Bob Cooter, and I do believe that they're trying to tailor an offense that is not going to turn the ball over a whole heck of a lot. And with that said, I don't think it's the right thing sometimes. Sometimes, maybe in a game like that versus the Giants, you need to turn it loose. Let it rip. Yeah, and th- I get, and I, I do like the conservative. and living it, You limit- like this? I like limiting mistakes, but you saw that they are able to kick it up a notch, to let the offense, let Matt Stafford throw the ball around. And I think what happened is that they didn't go to that soon enough. They they stuck with their same conservative ways way too long, and you know, I left. I stopped watching with about three minutes left because they they just weren't doing it. They they were, they were compl- they were just going three and out. They weren't moving the ball. I mean, I, I know I saw one Eric Ebron. It was like a third and seven. He catches it. It's a, it's a it's a completely typical Lions play. Third and seven. You throw the ball five yards. And the guy can't fall forward for another two yards. He was so slow to turn around. The the, the guy is right on top of him. I texted you at that point. I was like, I hate Eric Ebron, which it's not the first time I've said those words. It doesn't make sense. It, the Lions, they hurt my head. They hurt my heart. And it, it might be too early to talk about the next couple of games. The collapse that everyone is really panicking is that it's, that might happen. But what I am going to say is... If you truly believe what this team has done so far, and I, I, I think there's only one word you have to put with it is hope. You gotta hope, if, right? If you, you gotta hope because I was the, I was the guy at one and three. I didn't think they were even gonna win four games this entire season, and now they're what nine and five with two games left, two really tough games. I think there are positives that you can take away, or you can at least look at these games. You know, with this Giants game. It was a it was a really poor environment with it was a super cold day. You're outdoors, you're on the road. You you look at the next two games in Dallas, it's essentially an, an indoor stadium and then you come home for the last game. I think that's a, definitely a positive because you don't have to deal with any sort of inclement weather. So you in the Lions have just found they've shown this season that they can get it done. And you just have to hope that some way they get it done because I don't, I think the team, even though they were down in that game, part of me, I was, I kept watching because I I figured that, you know, Stafford had a drive in him and if they scored, you know, maybe they get a defensive stop, come back, kick a field goal. They could have easily won that game and it would have just been, it would have been super easy as an SLL lion fan to just, you know, stop watching and be like, ah, they're not coming back. You have to have hope that they have something left in the tank. 
Jason, a lot of people are panicking because they've seen this before. They've seen the Lions kind of start out the season strong and have a chance with a couple games left to do some things. But this was a game where you felt like if they just, you know, put forth the best effort that they could, minimize turnovers, pounce on the opportunities that are given to you, the Lions had opportunities to win the game. So um, to start the game, obviously you don't want to see the Giants just march up and down the field and take the ball 75 yards in 10 plays. You don't want to see that. And the first key moment was Odell Beckham drops the football, okay? And it's just a four, it's just a simple four-yard play, but it kind of kind of creeped into the, the theory that what's going on with who's watching on the sideline because I, during Monday's press conference when they asked about it, he said that on the road, it's really hard to get the replay. So a lot of people didn't see Odell Beckham drop the ball. The, the, the replay was late. They had already snapped the, the next play. So... It really leads you to believe that each and every play is important in a football game. Now, you could say that it's not the key deciding moment, but what you know, what comes out of that play is what's going on in the sideline? Are they paying attention? Are they invested? Hey, maybe they don't get that play, and the Lions get the ball first, and uh, the Lions get the ball back, forcing a three and out or forcing a turnover on downs. So you get a situation where what are the people that are watching the game looking at why is it the replay that slow? You can't say and come out and say that, oh, we on the road, we don't get an opportunity to see the replay. You have to see it. It's important. And many people say that Jim Caldwell values his timeouts more than challenging. He's only challenged three plays the entire 2016 season. So that kind of brought back people's notion that Caldwell in game management is not as good as it needs to be. And then second, you had two opportunities to change the momentum. Two you had an opportunity to kind of punch the football in when you're driving in the red zone. You hand the ball off to Zach Zenner, who is a thumper. You expect that he's going to fall forward, or you expect that he's going to get you yards after initial contact. He fumbles the football, which is an absolute no-no. Fumbles the football, the Giants recover. Okay, the Giants then on offense, you know, in a situation where they're driving, and they fumble the ball, they fumble it, and the Lions have an opportunity to recover. Right? They recover. Boom. Do they get the do they get the ball on the twenty yard line? No, they do not. Because the ball for some weird reason, whether it be slick, whether it be that the guy wasn't used to falling on the football, he does not get the football back. And that was I think the moment where I went, Oh boy, you needed that turnover. You needed that. But in the end, it didn't happen and the the Giants recovered it. It comes down to a manner of plays and I know it's an entire game and I know there there are a couple plays here and there that matter. We just need to. They, I'm not sure. Have they ever actually played a complete game? I mean, the Saints game has been probably the most complete game that they've played all season. I mean, would you agree? I agree. So I don't know. They're really going to have to bring their A game for these next two two games because the refs they're not helping anybody. I mean, they're they're bad all around the league. It's not just us. I mean, miss. I don't see how the refs can call that a catch. Nobody had a view of that of that Odell Beckham. That it literally, it skipped off the of the turf. So we, you just need to take you you need you need to take matters into your own hands. And that's eh, Caldwell. Caldwell and his in game management. I I don't think I will stand by this. I don't think his in game management has gotten better at all this season. I've said it before. It's Stafford. Stafford has been carrying this team, and he's been getting no help from his coach. You know, you give credit to Caldwell for keeping this team in line, keeping them looking forward only ahead so far, only to the game that, that's on their plate. But when it comes to game day, Stafford is carrying this team, and he just doesn't have the support around him with the players. Like, like you said, they don't have a starting NFL running back, and they don't have a true number one wide receiver. I think you could you could argue Golden Tate, when he's playing at his best, is the number one wide receiver, It's but he, he disappears. I know that we're talking and we're focusing exclusively on the Lions, what they failed to do, but I want to make an observation. The Giants' defense, not heralded, but they came to play, and each and every yard seemed like it was super tough because they were really on Matthew Stafford and they were really on the Lions' offense. They didn't allow too many yards after the catch. They didn't allow too many big plays. And even though they had, they had an injury themselves, Janoris Jenkins went out with, a, I think, a back injury. And they're missing Jason Pierre-Paul. They came out with a defensive effort that was stellar. And I think they you got, you got to give them a lot of credit. They were able to stuff the Lions in a lot of situations, force field goals, and they pressured Matthew Stafford. He was running around quite a bit in that game. And late, 
if you notice, if you paid, if you got a chance to pay attention, the final two plays in garbage time, they kind of pop Matthew Stafford a little bit, which is a little bit irritating. But in the end, you got to give the Giants credit; they came out to play. But w- another factor that made it tough for the Lions was the loss of Darius Slay. And injuries are a factor in games, but when you lose Darius Slay, that's kind of a big loss, and you're going to need him back. And there's talk. This week that, you know, when he gets his MRIs, that he might not be ready for Dallas. Yeah, when I saw Ace, what is his name, Ace Jackson covering Odell Beckham, I think that might have been the point where I was like, oh my god, it's only a matter of time at that point. Because Asa, uh, I think it's Asa Jackson. Asa Jackson is not going to cover Odell Beckham Jr. You need, I I, I don't know why Nevin Lawson was, It, it, it made no sense to me, and I don't know. It's this team, they kill you. And and I, I, I agree. I think you give a ton of credit to the Giants defense. I know late in the game, there was one play. I could have swore that the Giants defender, the rusher, he was he was over the line and it looked like he was off sides. But it was I think it was basically just the fact that he was that much faster than Decker. The Lions, they couldn't do anything. The Giants came to play. You can put a little bit of it on it that the Giants, you know, even though they haven't been as great lately, they actually know how to win. They have a leader in Eli Manning. They have leaders on defense and on offense. So the Lions need to figure it out quick. They do. And so before— Two tough games. Yeah. 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 Dallas, and it's—you know, I texted my brother. I'm like, you just have to take care of business at home. That, and that's really what it's going to come down to because it's—I'm not going to guarantee. I can't say that the, the Lions are going to win against the Cowboys. I think there's a chance that they can win, but logic would say that Cowboys are probably going to come out of that with a victory. So it's going to come down to week 17. You're tied with the Green Bay Packers, unless the Minnesota Vikings can actually become a football team again and help us out and beat the Packers. We're gonna look. It's it, we're going to be playing for our season. Yeah, on week seventeen. So and how 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 much panic do you feel that the Lions will lose the next two games to the Cowboys and the Packers at home? I'm not. I it's a it's a low level panic right now because I want to believe that. They're a different team, and they have proven that they can overcome some adversity with all these fourth quarter wins. And even though it is an easier schedule than most, and even the NFL just as a whole isn't that great this year, the that they have proven that they can come back and win, that they can make some key plays. So it's a low level panic, and really that panic level is it's the old lion fan of me. It's the it's the fan who. Who knows what this Lions team can do and what they've done in past years? You know, it this that's the Lion fan who was there when Paul Edinger kicked that field goal to rob us of getting into the playoffs. What was that ninety nine? That's the Lions fan who has the low level panic. Who knows that it's if we get into the Packers, it's anything can happen. Well, man, I, I'm nervous. I can't say that I'm like one of those hopeful fans right now, but. The the Lions have gotten to nine wins playing unconventionally, you know, with the running backs that we've talked about. So, and then and, and the key injury that I hope can maybe turn itself around is Theo Riddick. Absolutely, because with Theo Riddick out, you saw the third down plays. He was a third down specialist. He was also a factor in terms of helping the Lions extend plays and to earn more first downs. And without Theo Riddick, you saw that uh, the screen game wasn't as effective. And so, you know what? A couple of people tweeted me, which was really unusual. They said that, you know, the Lions did lack creativity. They wanted Golden Tate to rush the ball more. They were like, you know what? We, we're not rushing. Why not just go crazy and do some reverses to Golden Tate? Let him run a couple plays and see what happens. I was like, well, that's not really ideal because the more contact that he gets, the more chance likely that he's going to get hurt. But the, what, what, what people are saying is the Lions have to be more creative on offense because on first down, all you're seeing is handoff. They're trying desperately to reach balance, but they haven't had a 100-yard game, a 100-yard rusher since the Titan game, and that's back in September. Yeah, if in if you want to look at one team, it's the team that's chasing you. It's the Green Bay Packers. They have nobody at running back either. You know, Eddie Lacy gone for the season. James Starks has been de- dealing with injuries. And you know who they turn to? A wide receiver, Ty Montgomery. The dude had 15 carries, 154 yards. They're running him as a running back. Why can't, and you know, I know people are calling for Golden Tate. I don't think you do that because he's more valuable 
lined up out in the slot for you. But why not try a guy like Andre Roberts? Andre Roberts, who is a uh, he's more of a a scat type player, a scat back type player. Put him back there. Let him see what he can do, and maybe you get something. It, anything could. Anything should be on the table. It does concern me that they're just going to do the same old thing. That they're just going to come into this week and go with the same game plan and just hope that Theo Riddick is in there so he can be part of that game plan. Because without him, the throwing to the running back is just it is they don't even do it. But I'm going to say this: Monday Night Football. There's an opportunity for the Lions to do some things. I have a feeling they're going to play their best game. They might eke out a victory, but my spirit says close loss. But I do believe they're going to play much better in Jerry's Dome, in the billion-dollar or whatever, the multi-million-dollar stadium that he created. I do believe they're going to put on a super solid performance. And I do believe that they're taking it one game at a time. And I do think that if they can pressure Dak Prescott, they can limit Des Bryant, if they can somehow or another force a couple turnovers in a situation where maybe the Dallas Cowboys aren't as sharp. Maybe they try to, you know, I don't think that they're going to, I don't think the Cowboys are going to take the Lions too lightly because of the records, but they're maybe in their mindset, you get an opportunity where the Cowboys don't take you seriously and you get an opportunity to earn a couple interceptions, maybe some mistakes here and there. And with that, maybe you can take advantage, but I do see that Stafford's going to need to step it up again and really play a better game because Outside of New Orleans, outside of Houston, he hasn't gone for he hasn't gone off for three, four touchdowns like he has in the past, and they, that offense has to step it up. So I'm going to say this: I believe the Lions are going to play their best game Monday Night Football because there is a strong chance if the Green Bay Packers lose to the Minnesota Vikings, you clinch a spot in the playoffs. So I don't want it to come down to January 1st because a couple of plays that don't go your way. Aaron Rodgers doing his thing, and now they've somehow or another found a running game. People are going to be nervous, and if Green Bay takes the opening drive and goes down and shoves it in your throat and they score early, it's going to be a quiet Ford field, and I don't think this fan base deserves a team to collapse at that level. They don't deserve it. We don't deserve that, but a lot of people are feeling like that's the way the road is heading, but they got to go out there and maybe shock everybody because nobody's going to have them beating Dallas. Nobody. I think that they might play a a solid game, keep it close, because if it's a shootout, forget it. You're not going to keep up. But if you can keep it and muck it up a little bit, maybe Theo Riddick comes back. I think that's a key. If Darius Slay doesn't, uh, I don't know, dude. Des Bryant might put up some numbers. Yeah, well, I'm not sure. Des Bryant, he hasn't been the same Des Bryant uh, this entire year. And, you know, we get the benefit that Green Bay and the the Vikings play on Saturday. So we're going to know. If the Green Bay, if Green Bay actually loses that game, I think we can focus more on this game because you win that game, you clinch the, the division, and you can focus solely on that game. But if the Packers somehow, if they beat the Vikings, then how many people are actually going to start looking down the road to Green Bay? Because that's really going to be the game that matters. Because even if you do beat the Cowboys, there's still the chance that Green Bay beats you the next week and they get the tiebreaker with because you're you're gonna both be at ten and six in that scenario. So Cowboys game Monday Night Football. I think the biggest key is going to be selling out to stop Ezekiel Elliott, make Dak Prescott beat you. And I think if if you're able to limit Elliott under a hundred yards, you win the game. Oh boy. Okay. Here's the task at hand per Jason Jarvie: limit Ezekiel Elliott and that massive offensive line to less than 100 yards rushing. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's ooh. my prediction. You keep Elliott under 100 yards, you win the game. You He gets over 100 yards, it's game over. All right, I can't wait to see it. I'll be coming home from the uh, Quick Lane Bowl, and I'm going to sit back, have a couple beers, relax, and watch the Lions on Monday Night Football. I can't wait. I'm going to be cheering my heart out. I'm hoping that uh, they can do it, but I don't know. It's looking like potentially that January 1st matchup. Um I'll be there. If the, if it uh, goes down January 1st, I will be in attendance because um, me and the father-in-law now started a tradition. The last Lions home game we will probably attend every year. I might witness the pain live in person. You think I deserve it? Oh, uh, Nobody deserves that pain. But it could be elation, too, it because could be. clinching the spot at home. Maybe we, we would say this. Do you want the Lions, if they do clinch it, to clinch it versus Dallas or at home in front of the fans versus Green Bay, winner take all? 
I want them to just clinch it. I just, I don't want to be week 17. It makes for great drama. But I, as I'm getting older, I don't want the drama. I just want teams to take care of it. You know, we, we've had so much drama in sports this entire 2016. You know, the, the Cavs come back from 3-1 to win a championship. It's not same old the, Lions. The it's Cubs not same come old back Lions. to win from 3-1 down. It, all, it comes down to the last game. And I'm tired of it. I want the Lions to clinch against the Cowboys. I want the Vikings to shove the ball down Aaron Rodgers' throat, beat them, so we can just get it done. We can have we can put Dan Orlovsky on that game because I don't want if we do clinch. God help me if we clinch and Stafford plays any of Week 17, I'm gonna lose my shit. Okay, let's go to timeout. We'll talk, um, take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll talk about Michigan State and what the heck has happened to the football team, what's happened to the basketball team, the disastrous state of affairs of the Michigan State Spartans coming up next on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Doc here for the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Thanks, everybody, that's been checking us out, downloading our podcast, subscribing to our daily podcast via iTunes. We greatly appreciate it. We couldn't keep the lights on. We couldn't keep the studio mics hot without uh, your great support, and we greatly appreciate all the great support. The easiest way to keep us going and to support us is check out our website, DetroitSportsPodcast.com. It's the hub of the operation. It's where you can go to hear all the great podcasts and to see what's going on with our podcast network. DetroitSportsPodcast.com. We greatly appreciate it. Pedal down the book, yeah. Willie's on the front. Pedal down the book, yeah. Willie's on the front. I got this 89.90. This is champ flat bill. Black store the cap with the hologram tags. White mag rims, red rubber tires. Chain frame pants, drip shit to my supplier. Dope man attire. Give me about an hour and I have it clicking, ticking, blind fly like MacGyver. I'm a Motor City Sports Rant, Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Bumping the jam, Jason. What's up with oh, this? Yeah, I got the cool kids. I, I was about to rap, but I, I <laughs> you don't know. I just uh, pedaled down the hook. You wheelies on the front. Boop, boop. <laughs> Good with stuff, a little sir. Little bit of gold and a page. The best thing about doing this podcast with you is I get a chance to uh, check in with what's going on in the hip hop scene because I never heard of this. So this is interesting. Good That's stuff, old man. That's probably back from. Early 2000s. Early 2000s, my goodness. Oh, but the Michigan State Spartans. How do you feel, Jason? I want to go back to the early 2000s, at least in basketball, because their basketball team sucks. What the hell happened? I thought this team was supposed to be competing for the national championship this year. We were talking that this is going to be, this is Tom Hizzo's best class. This is going to be his, his best chance to win a championship, and it is just an Utter failure. It's, now I get they've played good teams, but Northeastern? Who 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 is Northeastern? Unbelievable. What's, what's, they lost he, them. what's their mascot? It's unbelievable they lost to them. Well, let's start with this. Miles Bridges is hurt, so it's thrown off everything. They haven't played as well. And right now, what I really think Michigan State's going through is a lack of confidence. They were highly touted, a team that, you know, many people said that this was, you know, Tom Izzo's best recruiting class, and it hasn't come together just yet. When you put the schedule that Tom Izzo does year in, year out, it's super tough. And when you lose those games, you don't get really a, a marquee win versus, you know, a Kentucky or versus an Arizona or a Duke. And you don't get, a, a you know, a victory versus one of your top opponents. It makes you think, well... How good are we? And then you come at home and you probably think it's going to be a cakewalk versus Northeastern. You get outplayed. You get out-rebounded. And Tom Izzo said it that, hey, you know, Northeastern was the better team because they came out and actually played super hard. And Michigan State can't do that. Michigan State overlooked the team, and that's what happens. But I don't. I know it's, you know, people are nervous, but you got to remember, don't get too nervous regarding November and December basketball. Just see that the team is progressing. Let's see how they do once the Big Ten season starts, once Miles Bridges comes back, once the team gets a little bit better and more acclimated to the system. I do think that they're getting a little bit snake bitten by some injuries to key players. Right now they're dealing with a confidence issue. But I do believe Tom Izzo will correct it. But you got to also remember, the program took a huge gut punch when they lost to Middle Tennessee State in the first round because even the president, the president of the United States had them in his bracket winning it all. 
Everybody in the country had them at least in the final four, even getting to the title game. And you go out there and you lose in the first round. So that's a significant uh, setback for maybe Tom Izzo, the program, and things like that. And right now they're kind of stuck in mediocrity, and they got to turn it around. Yeah, and I think you can almost point to you, you can point to what the reason is. In, in years past, you have guys like Keith Appling, Denzel Valentine going back. You you got guys like Draymond Green who are performing in in the NBA. Gary Harris, and we have all this talent that Tom Izzo, it's one of his best recruiting classes ever. But who do you actually have to lead on on this team? And, you know, the Dukes and the Kentuckys can get away with it because they get so much talent. And we got really good pe- players, but we don't we don't have, like, an entire – we can't put an entire lineup of all freshmen that are, you know, one through t- – We they're all in the top ten in the, in the players in America – so we have a couple really good players that, are, that have come in, but we don't have any leaders. We, I mean, your leaders right now are Aaron Harris. Cassius Winston. Gavin Schilling. Cassius Winston, he's not a leader. He's a freshman. Right, but he's expected to perform. But uh, Gavin Schilling's hurt. And, uh, you know, he's coming back, working his way back, trying his absolute best. But when you start the season and you're expecting you got six foot nine transfer Ben Carter is going to do some things and maybe you know be a guy that can maybe extend the 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 offense a little bit and shoot from the perimeter. He goes down with the similar injury that he had last year. Then you had Gavin Schilling go down. He was a defensive warrior, so they were expecting him to be the guy that gets the offensive rebounds. And uh, he wasn't you know wasn't available early on in the season. And uh, you lose a little bit with those injuries. And then what happens is guys that you think are going to be role players, maybe getting six to twelve minutes a night, are forced to be starters. You know you can't have that happen. Uh, Nick Ward, Kenny Goins are now forced to play a little bit more. Tum Tum Nairns has got to you know step it up a little bit. And what's happened is when people go down. You expect that the next man up is going to perform at, at a similar level. That just hasn't been the case. And the leaders that are actually playing game in and game out haven't done a decent job game in and game out. And that's what happens. You struggle. It's going to be important that the veterans that play on this team step it up. They just haven't done a, a, enough. A guy that I can look to is senior guard Harris. Wildly, wildly inconsistent where he could play and drop 30 points one night versus you know Florida Gulf Coast. And then, you know, you lose to Baylor and scores less than five points. You can't have that. You got to be in a situation where you can count on a guy like Harris, I believe, versus Northeastern. He wasn't even on the court at the end of the game. He was on the bench. He was struggling. And that's a guy that you're going to need everybody to contribute. And it's just one of those things where if Tum Tum Naren, if Harris isn't going to play well, you're dealing with injuries, your superstar in Miles Bridges is on the bench. It's going to be. It's going to lead to a team that struggles, and it's one of those things where it's sad to see because everybody had super high expectations, but the schedule is getting to them. Everyone's talking about it. Wednesday, you think Michigan State at home drops a game to Oakland? That's the game everyone's kind of wanting to see. Like, okay, Oakland's been knocking at the door, knocking at the door. They've been. They, they've played Michigan State close with 16 minutes left in the game in a lot of seasons, and Oakland's a good shooting team. Where if they get off to a decent start different than in the past. I'm telling you, going out there and watching them, they can shoot out, they can shoot threes. They got defenders, they play a style similar to Michigan State, but they can score 11 deep. And if they can get hot from the three-point line, look out. I'm not calling it yet, but if the performance that Michigan State put out Sunday it occurs on Wednesday, they're going to lose. I think this is probably going to be one of their best chances to to beat the Spartans and like you said, yeah. They've been trying for years now. They came so close last year to to upsetting that that team uh, with all those veterans. So you have a team with a bunch of really players who all they've done is lose to really good teams. Now, what I will say is I think the Spartans are going to come out and they're going to do everything they can to win this game. So that's going to make it tough for the Grizzlies. And I think if you... If they hadn't lost this Northeastern game and, and it would have been Oakland first before Northeastern, I think you actually even give the the Golden Grizzlies a better chance of winning that game because now they've just been they've probably gone through hell with Tom Izzo over the last twenty four hours. So they're gonna they're gonna want to come out. 
and they're going to want to beat whoever is on the court, and it just so happens to be Oakland. So while I think anything can happen, I just don't see it happening this week. Wednesday, December 21st, 7 p.m., Big Ten Network from East Lansing, Oakland Golden Grizzlies led by head coach Greg Campy takes their squad into East Lansing. And the tough part is, though, and I think that that's where State has the advantages, Oakland's playing on Tuesday night as well. So they're playing Northeastern, the same squad that just beat Michigan State. So they're going to have to maybe put out a little bit more to beat them. So I think they might, I think Oakland's going to keep it close, but they're going to struggle down the stretch because it's going to be a back-to-back game and it might be super tough for them to really bring it for the entire 40 minutes. We'll see. They've done it before, but it's going to be tough to go into East Lansing and get the victory, especially, you know, given it'll really, you look to see what happens Tuesday on, uh, look to see Tuesday what happens versus Northeastern, how much effort they got to put in because it's going to be tough because uh, Michigan State's resting. Now, one thing before we go on to the Pistons and Red Wings, the, it came out over the past uh, couple days. First, it was Leonard Fournette from L- the running back from LSU came out and said that he was going to skip the the Tigers bowl game so he could focus on preparing for the NFL draft. And then today came out running back Christian McCaffrey says he's going to skip Stanford's bowl game to do the same thing to to be ready for the NFL draft because he doesn't want to jeopardize his value. Did you hear Malik McDowell's going to skip the Spartans bowl game? Oh. I don't think there's a bowl game for them to skip. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be surprised if he would have. <laughs> he dealt with so many injuries this year. If we did happen, I, I couldn't blame him. I mean, how do you feel about it? Because my my thoughts is that you. I don't blame any of these players for doing that, especially if you have if you've talked to people and you have a first round value on you. Why would anybody, unless you're going for a national championship, why would you want to risk that? Hundred percent. I agree with you. It's all about the dollars. It's one of those things where these guys know that if they're one play away from potentially ruining millions of dollars, you got to do it. Um, in terms of where the universities stand, they, they might you know be forced to make a stand in the future because more and more guys are probably going to do it going forward. So look to see maybe this is a contentious battle that might uh, escalate a little bit further into some heated debates because if you're an athlete, you know what uh, – what used to happen in the past, you know what they would say? I think I heard, I can't pinpoint who said it, but what would happen is if you had eyes on the NFL in the past, you would uh, over-exaggerate like a single play and just kind of sit out the bowl game. So you, you'd play, maybe just, uh, you know, maybe get hit a little bit and over-exaggerate and be out for the whole bowl game and try to potentially limit your impact. But these guys are looking now towards the NFL. They deserve it. They've earned that opportunity, so they should, and I agree with them 100%. But in terms of, if you're a college university, if you're a bowl game and you're a, fa- you're a fan and you want to see these guys, it makes it, it, makes it uh, a little bit cheapened, but I agree 100%. It's, it's going to happen more, and I truly believe that these guys should look to their professional futures. It's unfortunate to say it that it, uh, at this point in time, when you're that close to the big contract, risking an ankle injury, risking you know, getting hurt or blowing on an ACL. Look exactly. at uh, Jalen Smith from Notre Dame last year. Exactly. He probably would have been a top 10 pick and he goes in. He may not even play again. Exactly. So you look at it and you go, forget it. It's not worth it. And I think maybe that, you know, injury might have sent shockwaves and it might have more um, of an impact than, you know, and there's been injuries in the past, but like you said, just recently, a significant injury in a bowl game and a guy that was, potentially looking to cash in is not uh, any longer potentially going to play in the NFL. I'm really surprised that we haven't seen this earlier. You know, I think it's uh we've, we've heard some cases, you know, you look at a guy like Maurice Claret, he tried to declare early, but then he got shot down and then obviously everything spiraled out of control for him. But uh, I think, yeah, totally. We're going to see this a ton. And I think the next logical step is going to be a guy is going to sit out his sophomore year. And I, I honestly, I wouldn't have blamed Leonard Fournette for sitting out this past year because I don't think his stock was any higher was it when it was in his freshman year. If he would have sat out, he wouldn't have dealt with those injuries, and he would have probably been looking at first-round money, probably maybe even top 10. Okay, before we talk about the Wings and Pistons, I do want to ask you this, and probably we'll talk about it more maybe when we get back in the new year, but... Mark D'Antonio came out and announced something that pissed everybody off. And it's a little bit deflating. I don't want to end on that just devastating note, but he's bringing everybody back. The band is back together. And he's kind of clarified his comments and said that 
it's easier to correct the problems from people that know what's going on from within instead of trying to bring an outsider. I'm just going to say this and preface it by saying this. You just had, you didn't have like a season where you went seven and six. You went three and nine. And another factor that a lot of people are talking about is Malik McDowell quit on you. So that means he didn't quit not only on Michigan State, he quit on the program. He, you know, had some, some from what I hear, some behind the scenes behavioral issues in terms of what his uh, at, overall attitude was for the Michigan State Spartans. So that leads me to believe that you got coaches that maybe some of the players, maybe high-end players, don't want to play for. And look at this. The top recruits, numbers one through five in the state of Michigan, where are they going? Are they coming to East Lansing? No. Mm, they are not. So let's look at it like this. Sometimes you have to make tough choices. Right now, Coach D'Antonio's not. So I'm a little bit nervous that uh, the train might be speeding by and Harbaugh and Urban Meyer might be passing Michigan State by. But listen, bad choice in my opinion. I think you should have started over with an OC and DC to help this squad out. You asked the same question on Twitter, and I will say the exact same thing. You know, Adam can disagree with me all he wants. If we come back next year, have a similar season, three and nine, or even worse, it's going to be Mark D'Antonio's last. It's it, there, there, and really, there shouldn't be any question about that because a team who just competed for a national championship shouldn't you shouldn't have back to back three or less win seasons. Exactly. Now, I get, I will, I will give him the the benefit of the doubt. He comes back next year. He goes six and six. Maybe he goes seven and five. Five and eight would probably be the lowest that I'd ever want to see, but I want to see improvement on this team. And, and that's going to be the biggest thing is he has built up uh, all all this rapport with, with all the fans and with all, everybody at Michigan State that he deserves a chance to come back next year and try and correct things. And it just got off to a really bad start. So it does concern me. I love Mark D'Antonio. But I will not stand. I I will not stand for another season like this, man. And then he, we we finished the, the this podcast talking about struggles. The Pistons and Wings the last week or so have been very tough to watch. The Wings obviously responded to Zetterberg's you know speech talking about the play in the homestand. They got the victory finally. They played Anaheim tough. They scored a lot of goals. They did some things that were positive, but overall. The Wings play as of late collectively in the last two weeks has been poor. And the Pistons as well, they are struggling so mightily in terms of trying to acclimate playing back with Reggie Jackson. It's unbelievable that the teams playing in the winter outside of the Lions, the Pistons and Wings are struggling so much. And it's really tough because game in, game out, you don't know which team is going to show up. Because the Pistons can play with teams in the NBA, but when they don't play defense, when they're inconsistent on offense... And the Wings, they just don't want to shoot the damn puck. They are, you know, bottom of the league in terms of shots. They're bottom of the league in terms of, you know, goals. They got to put the puck in the net, and they need to play much better. It's been really a tough end of the year for these two squads. Yeah, and the, the biggest concern for me would be the 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 Red Wings. The Pistons, I think they – I believe in Stan Van Gundy and – you still believe, huh? I, 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 st- I do still believe in Sam and Gundy, and I think a lot of it has to do with it's a they play a completely different game with Reggie Jackson. Ish Smith was a completely different player, and they you saw right towards right before Reggie got back that the Pistons were finally getting comfortable with the way he played, and now you throw Reggie in the mix. He obviously needs uh, some games to get back up to NBA speed, and they just haven't. They haven't clicked yet. I think that's going to come. And I think SVG, y- you've seen what he's done. And I think you... He, so worry more about the Wings. Oh, totally. The Wings... Not making the playoffs. The Wings, I hope not. I, I honestly hope that they don't make it at this point because they are a hot dumpster fire. They All they have, they have a, like a ton of the same player. The the the, the Tatars, the Nyquist. And this is actually... I actually thought about this as I was talking about the Wings with my brother. Uh, remember... Uh, Right before I started this podcast, the Motor City Sports Rant, and I came on the Doc and Jock show, what did I say that you guys should do, what the Red Wings should do? They should trade Thomas Tatar. At the height of his value. And what's Thomas Tatar doing? He gave you a hat trick last night mm. in a meaningless win the, in, a, in a season that if you make the playoffs, you're just going to perpetuate the stigma that everything's all right with the Red Wings. 
You should have got your value then. I was right. People, you should admit that I'm right. You were and right. You Jason. should throw, you should throw that out on Twitter. Say Jason was right. You know what I'll do? I will potentially change your bio. Because you need you need to change my bio because <laughs> I, I was right. Thomas Tatar and uh, Nyquist, they got to step it up. Yeah, it's just right now Dylan Larkin, he's kind of experiencing the second-year struggles. The goaltending has been a little bit inconsistent. And you look at it and you go, what's the issue? The issue is this. You, are, you, you don't have a defenseman that can help your offense move the puck from zone to zone. Everyone knows that you need a puck moving defenseman. They struggle so mightily. They are unable to keep uh, possession long uh, long term. They don't have the constant ability to pressure the opponent in the in the opponent's zone. And what you see is, you know, they can play with teams, but when they make that turnover or that mistake, the puck's in their net. And there's too many odd man rushes. There's too many situations where the Red Wing, uh, too many situations where the Red Wings have an opportunity via special teams in the power play. They don't get no shots. Now, I'm not talking about consistent shots. I'm talking about any shots on the power play of value. And that goes into effort in terms of just shooting the puck, getting the garbage goals. Look what happened. Look what happened versus Anaheim. You shot the puck. You got some rebound goals. You were able to do some things. You got to do more of that. Can they do that night in, night out? That's the big question mark. And now we're all a little bit nervous regarding what happened to Mike Green because he got cheap shot late in the game versus Anaheim, and he's day-to-day. But you got to look at it and... The Red Wings, I definitely agree with you. I'm in panic mode with them. I think it's going to be a, a a long season, and you're going to see stretches where they're going to struggle. And uh, they I don't need know. to bottom out. I'm at the, I'm not at the panic point. I'm at the point where I'm I'd panic if they actually start winning games and they make the playoffs. Is it too early to talk about firing Blashill? I've thrown it out there a couple times. No, I don't think. I think is it at ho- this because a lot of people were like in the no, middle, it's middle, not holland it's holland it is holland but in the middle of the season i just don't see what it would do and if you do you agree they need to miss the playoffs this year they need to miss they need to bottom out but so I, they can Adam start said, rebuilding this year's draft doesn't have that much talent to pick from but you need to you need to begin somewhere what so you're just going to prolong again i would rather start now you know start trading off Literally everything. I don't. I really. I don't think anybody is on the table at this point. Dylan Larkin is a great player, and I'm not going to say to trade Dylan Larkin because I think he could be a key on this team. But I, I compare if I look at the Red Wings and I look at what the Blackhawks did. The Blackhawks went out. They got Patrick Kane. I look at Dylan Larkin. I see a, a young Patrick Kane type player. But we don't have Jonathan Taze. Jonathan Taze is the captain. He's the leader of that Blackhawk team, and he can put the puck in the net. He can he can throw his weight around. We don't have that player on the Red Wings. We just have a guy who can dangle. He can make a good shot here and there. We don't have a leader on the team. It It's all gone downhill since Lizstrom's left. So we need to bottom wah, out wah, now. Wah, we need to – I, I think it's time for Holland to go. I think Holland needs to go. Blow it up. I think he needs to get rid of Blashell. And this is I'm I'm saying this rationally. I'm not I'm not in a in a rage over this. This is just what needs to happen. It needs to. It's uh, it's one of those things where Holland's moves have caught up to him. You're not getting the production. You're not seeing that uh, you know the young guys are getting the minutes that they deserve. Ken Holland lucked into the roster that he had. He got lucky that he had probably the best defender of all time in Nick Lidstrom. And the carryovers from, you know, the Steve Eisermans and the Brendan Shanahans going into the Zetterbergs and Datsuks. And when it really came time to build a team, he couldn't do it. All right, sir. This 89th edition of the podcast is going to come to a close. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas to you and yours. We'll come back strong the first week of January. Recap what the heck's going on with the Wings. Lions, have they made the postseason? Can we come back January 2nd, all sad, that Monday, record the podcast post-mortem, share our experiences, start the new year off talking about that, or the elation of a first-round potential game at home at Ford Field? Can we be talking about, uh, you know, Michigan playing a solid game? Can we be talking about, uh, you know, Michigan State's further collapse in basketball? We shall see. A lot of good things to look forward to. And uh, January 1st will be a fun day, too. The Wings... And the Lions are going to play same day and start the new year off right. Lions are going to be in the playoffs. All right. And I'll end it on that. Until the new year. Later. Pedal to the hook. You really do the throat. Boop, boop. Okay.
Hey, nice idiot. Uh, f- you. Bye bye. Good day, sir. I said good day. All right. Take care now. <laughs> bye bye then. Hey, you sir.